Thank you all for being here. Sorry we had kind of an important conference. Uh, the Subcommittee on National Security of the Board and Foreign Affairs will come to order. Welcome everyone without objection. I may declare a recess at any time. I recognize myself for making an opening statement. The Biden administration's open border policies have led to the worst border crisis in America's history. Millions of illegal aliens have entered the United States under the Biden administration, impacting every community across the country. This Congress, both my subcommittee and the full committee, have examined the consequences of the Biden administration's horrendous policies. The president has unnecessarily created a national security and humanitarian crisis by refusing to uphold the rule of law. Today we are examining how the border crisis affects safety in our towns, cities, and communities. Not surprisingly, the open southwest border has attracted many illegal immigrants with criminal histories. But rather than simply deport those with criminal backgrounds, the Biden administration is letting them remain in our communities, even after they're showing that they're criminals. In fact, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement now, now detained docket has at least 617,000 aliens with criminal convictions or pending criminal charges. That's a non-detained docket. One would think that being a criminal illegal alien, at a minimum, would make someone an enforcement priority, but it is not under the Biden administration. In 2021, Secretary Mayorkas issued a memorandum entitled Guidelines for the Enforcement of Civil Immigration Law, stating that criminal history doesn't automatically make an illegal alien an enforcement priority. Instead, immigration officers have to engage in a complex analysis of whether the criminal illegal alien is a current, quote, current public safety threat to be considered an enforcement priority. What does that mean? In 2022, the ICE principal legal advisor issued a memorandum interpreting Mayorkas' guidelines. Her memorandum stated, the existence of criminal history alone, regardless of severity, will not necessarily indicate that a non-citizen presently poses a current public safety threat pursuant to the Secretary's priorities. I should say that again. The existence of criminal history, regardless of seniority, they say, doesn't necessarily mean we have a, a safety threat here. According to this standard, a criminal alien could theoretically be a convicted murderer and avoid becoming an enforcement priority for ICE. The administration will wait to enforce our laws until the threat is deemed by them to be a current threat. By that time, it will be too late as we have seen too many, by that time it will be too late as we've seen too many times in recent months. Even if the Biden administration cared to enforce our laws, sanctuary jurisdictions work to make our country less safe by shielding those criminals from immigration consequences. Sanctuary jurisdictions across the country refuse to cooperate with federal immigration authorities, mainly in the case where an individual is arrested or convicted for criminal activity. In contrast to the harm caused by sanctuary jurisdictions today, we have two sheriffs representing communities that are not sanctuary jurisdictions. These sheriffs are fighting at the local level to keep the, their constituents safe from criminal legal aliens, criminal legal aliens who shouldn't be in the U.S. to commit crimes against our citizens. Today, I imagine we will hear from the other side lots of claims about flaws, studies with shaky evidence seeking to show that illegal immigrants are somehow less likely to commit crimes in the U.S. Cite those statistics all you want to the victims of crime and those committed by criminal illegal aliens. I doubt shaky statistical claims and platitudes will make them whole. The fact is illegal immigrants should not be in the country in the first place and able to commit these crimes. Moreover, an analysis by the Texas Department of Public Safety showed that illegal aliens are more likely to be convicted of homicide, sexual assault, and kidnapping than the average Texan. The solutions aren't hard. Secure the border, stop releasing illegal aliens in the country in droves, and when an illegal alien commits a crime in this community, turn them over to ICE, enforce the law, and remove them. It's just that simple. Um, now, we, before we uh, uh, begin the testimony, I'll ask unanimous consent that Representative Jasmine Crockett from Texas be waived on the subcommittee for the purposes of asking questions. Without objection, so ordered. 
I would now like to recognize Ranking Member Garcia for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to our, all of our witnesses that are, that are here today. Now, I want to just start on, we all know that on June 16th, 2015, uh, Donald Trump rode down the escalator at Trump Tower to launch his campaign for president. And I want to remind us what he said that day, and I quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists, end quote. Now, we all know that's who Donald Trump is, and he controls the Republican Party, so we are here today. He's basing his 2024 campaign, as we all know, on the exact same rhetoric. Now, just weeks ago, weeks ago, Trump referred to immigrants who enter the country illegally as, quote, animals, nearly half a dozen times. He literally said, and I quote, Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans, Trump said. Quote, I said, no, they're not humans, they're animals, end quote. He's also repeatedly claimed that South American countries are emptying the, their what he calls insane asylums and mental institutions to send the patients to the U.S. as migrants. Now, we know that's not happening, and here's evidence that even his own campaign can't provide any evidence for in what he said. What he continues to say are lies and untruths. These fact checks are important. Now, I'm an immigrant. I came here as a young child. My parents came here to build better lives. My mom worked as a healthcare worker. When I took an oath to become a US citizen, it was the proudest day of my life. And so I personally am offended, not just from what I hear, but for the way Donald Trump and the House majority speaks about migrants and folks that come here for a better life. Donald Trump wants to claim that people like me and my family are poisoning the blood of our country, as he likes to say. It's disgusting and it's un-American. And it has real consequences, like the white supremacists at Charlottesville, who Trump called, and I quote, very fine people. It provokes people like the white nationalists who targeted people of Mexican descent in El Paso, murdering 23 innocent people. Now, I love this country. I, I know that uh, our, our, our chairman also loves this country. But I also think it's important that we don't divide all of us that are here. We should cut through the noise and actually look at some of the facts and data. And as much as some in the House majority may not like facts and data, it's important to review them. I want to run through some unanimous consent requests. Here's NBC. Trump's claims of a migrant crime wave are not supported by national data. Thank you. Here's a, here's a second one, a ABC, and I quote, no, migrants are not driving a surge in violent crime, as Trump claims. Thank you. Here's another one, USA Today, no, migrants aren't more likely to commit crimes than U.S. born, despite Trump's border speech. No objection. Thank you. Here, and, and if you prefer maybe academic sources, here's research from Stanford, which looked at 140 years of data. 140 years of data and finds conclusively that migration does not increase crime. Right now, in fact, immigrants are 60% immigrants are less likely to be incarcerated than people born in the United States. 60% less likely. And let's be clear, undocumented people are less likely to be incarcerated than native-born people as well. And here's a Brennan Center report, which hopefully points out that, and I quote, the spike in violent crime happened on Trump's watch, not Biden's. In 2020, the final year of the Trump presidency, murder rose by nearly 30% and assault by more than 10%. So I'd like to, to, to submit that as well, sir. Thank you. So just to conclude, pre under President Biden, crime has fallen nationwide, and those are the facts. So I just hope that we can stop with the fear-mongering, and I look forward to the rest of the hearing. Okay, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our witnesses today. I'll rattle them off. Ken Cuccinelli, Senior Fellow for Immigration and Homeland Security at the Center for Renewing America. He served as the 46th Attorney General of Virginia from 2010 to 2014. He also served as Director of United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and as Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security under the Trump administration. Sheriff Bill Wayborn has served as Sheriff of Tarrant County, Texas since 2017. He previously served this country as a member of the Air Force. He continues his public services after he continued his public service after leaving the armed forces as a Texas police officer. Sheriff Mike Chapman has served as the 
Sheriff of Loudoun County, Virginia since 2012. Sheriff Chapman previously served at the DEA and the Howard County, Maryland Police Department. David Beer is the Director of Immigration Studies at the Cato Institute. He previously served as Senior Policy Advisor to former Representative Roe Labrador of Idaho. I want to thank you all for being here. Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses answer in the affirmative. Thank you. You may sit down. We appreciate you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we've already read your written statements and will appear fully in the hearing record. Please, if you can, limit your oral statement to five minutes. As a reminder, please press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it's on, the members can hear you. When you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow. That means you've got one minute to go. When the red light comes on, your five minutes have expired, and we wish you'd wrap it up. I now recognize Mr. Cuccinelli for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee, you've probably heard the phrase, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, here is today's main thing. Every single crime committed by an illegal alien invader is preventable. Crime rates do not matter. Only the raw number of crimes and the harm caused by those crimes matter. Over 10 million illegal alien invaders have entered America since Joe Biden became our president and opened our borders. The chaos at our southern border is sadly not confined there. As far too many American families have intimately learned, the chaos at the border is directly contributing to unnecessary suffering and tragedy in communities all over the country, most recently and prominently, Athens, Georgia. The lives of our citizens are being forever altered by crime facilitated by open border policies and the cartel-driven invasion occurring because of it. The failed policies of this administration are callously indifferent at best and willfully negligent at worst, serving only to exacerbate the pain and suffering of the very citizens from whom it derives its legitimacy. The statistics from these failed policies are alarming. Tens of thousands of deaths, huge increases in human trafficking, outbreaks of previously defeated diseases like measles and tuberculosis. But it is the individual human cost that remains most alarming. The ever-growing number of American victims of illegal immigration including Brandon Michael, Kate Steinle, Molly Tibbetts, Sarah Root, Brandon Mendoza, Ronald Da Silva, Kayla Hamilton, and of course, Lakin Riley, not Lincoln. These are the human casualties that are preventable with a secure border. The sad reality is that there are tens of thousands of additional names of deceased Americans who could and should be read aloud in a hearing such as this. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Instead, we hear false narratives and manipulated data that parse the crime rates of illegal aliens with American citizens. And yet every illegal entry into the United States is a crime. The crime rate for illegal immigrants is 100%. Every one of them broke the law when they invaded our country illegally. The Texas Department of Public Safety tries to keep track of criminal alien activities as best they can. Since June of 2011, Texas has experienced a minimum of 65,999 assault charges, 6,594 rape charges, 61,155 drug charges, 2,998 robbery charges, and 970 homicide charges attributable to criminal illegal aliens in the last 13 years. And lest anyone forget, the Bureau of Justice Statistics suggests that more than 50% of violent crimes and 70% of property crimes are never reported to law enforcement. These numbers of crimes by illegal aliens in Texas that I refer to is clearly, dramatically undercounted. None of these criminals should be in the United States in the first place. Every citizen victimized by an illegal immigrant is a victim that could and should have been prevented. With common sense border and immigration policies carried out by elected officials who possess a shred of concern for those they represent. Arguments over citizen versus non citizen crime rates are ivory tower intellectual exercises that miss this fundamental point. 
For the ivory tower dwellers, if you truly want to find the number of crimes committed by illegal aliens, the deck is stacked decidedly against you. Just a few factors that make a full accounting of the criminals who are illegal aliens impossible include the time it takes to identify criminals in law enforcement custody as illegal aliens, sanctuary city and state policies that withhold information normally relied upon between jurisdictions, the slowness of the federal government in determining legal status, and that can include both capability and cooperativeness, cash bail policies that turn criminals back out on the street immediately, and the obvious interest that illegal aliens have in not being discovered. I'll close by returning to the main thing. Every murder, every assault, every robbery, every rape, Every drunk driving death and every murder committed by illegal immigrants was preventable. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Sheriff Wayburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. It's truly an honor to be here from Texas, and thank you for having me. Uh, while I only represent Tarrant County Sheriff's Office this morning, I feel certain that every sheriff in America is concerned with the border and its impact on their communities. If you'll allow me just a couple of minutes, I'll take you to ground zero in Tarrant County on issues that we have faced. Just recently, a gentleman gets up in the morning in southern Tarrant County and his car is missing. He calls the police, the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office, and, and as he's reporting it, he notices on his OnStar that his vehicle is going across the border into Mexico before he even finished the report. And uh, further, you know, the DPS at the same time, just a few days later, and and along with HSI is taking down a stash house in Tarrant County with several immigrants in it that owed the cartel money. Finally, there's another stash house that, that, that we assisted in helping with that they literally had cages in the houses where they were keeping women for cartel money. They were waiting to pay off their debts. And according to the HHS, in the last three years, we've had over 2,500 children unescorted minors settled in Tarrant County. Now, I bring that up for one reason. Who's following up on them? Are those children safe? Is there something nefarious going on there? We're not sure. We're also told by HSI that approximately 1,000 illegal aliens every couple of weeks are settling in the DFW area. As uh, all of these things are happening, also we have city police agencies work, working fentanyl homicides, including including a, a, a county judge, a former county judge dying from it, because fentanyl knows no boundaries. And another city police agency at the same time is working a fentanyl poisoning of a two-year-old that got into somebody's stash. In 2020 in Fort Worth, Texas, you could buy a, a, a gram of methamphetamine for $80. Today, that same gram would cost you 15 to 20. In 2020, you would spend $30 on a pill that can contain fentanyl. That same pill today cost $8. Inflation's had a tremendous reverse in the dope business. In 2020, the Tarrant County Narcotics Team took $3.5 million worth of drugs off the street. In 2021, they took $21 million of drugs off the street. In 22, 35 million. Also at all of these scenes often were cartel members that we have arrested and also that we hear from DEA that the cartel members working in our area, 90% of them are illegally in the U.S. And yes, they do have American citizens assisting them. Our mental health teams in the jail has told us that uh, the strong availability of illegal drugs has caused the skyrocketing of our mental health issue. And it's going from 2017 to 25% of the population to 66% today, with 42% of them being chronic. And marijuana with strong THC is also a part of that issue. While Tarrant County, between May of last year and December, we had over 3,000 overdoses of opioids. Many were fatal. Our interdiction team, made up of eight different counties in the first quarter of this year, has taken $21 million of drugs off the road. All of this cartel dope. And also in November, the cartel decided to shoot it out with our team, injuring one of our officers. We vigorously returned fire and we terminated that threat and recovered 14 kilos of drugs. 
The impact on our county jail is that we have an average population of 4,200 people. 6% of that population is generally illegal aliens. Of that, 264 in custody, they've allegedly committed 178 violent crimes, including eight murders and 44 sexual assaults of children. Please note that there's a approximately 15 different countries represented in that group, and 10% being from Venezuela, in fact, affiliated with Venezuela gangs. We have seen a large number of Venezuelans come across the border recently, and it's interesting to note that Intel, the country that doesn't talk to us at all, is that their prison population has been reduced by 25%. And back at the Tarrant County Jail, those illegal aliens cost the Tarrant County taxpayers about $24,000 a day to house them. We have solicited intelligence from directly from cartel members in jail, asking them the proverbial question, why are you killing your clients with this fentanyl? And their simple answer was, whatever kills the American is good with us. Based on our intel, we believe, common, our common belief in law enforcement in that part of the world, that China, the Mexican cartel, and Venezuela is weaponizing fentanyl to use against us. With a daily overdose in Tarrant County of 15 and a fentanyl death every day and a half and 300 in the nation, we are very thankful for Narcan. We've had tons of saves with Narcan dozens of times. The sheriffs in Texas agree that securing the border, securing the border and reforming immigration are entirely two different issues. And that we first must cons uh, secure the border. <clears throat> With the concern of the terrorist watch list people showing up at the border with, with, that we've identified in the near two million gotaways, it's those other people that we don't know about that keeps us up at night. And Christopher Wray from the FBI has sounded the alarm. All warning lights are on. While I uh, would like to ask lawmakers to, to do a lot of things, one of the things that the long haul is is that we do have to curb our appetite for drugs and sex trafficking. That's an issue of America. With all that said, we must, I believe, urgently dispatch resources to secure our border, insist on other countries following the rule of law, including asylum, and uh, hold the threat of trade and foreign aid in the balance. Finally, formally declaring the Mexican cartels as public enemy number one, and ensure that the only invitation to come to America is that of, which is of legal means, which we, we invite those people and greet them with open arms. Thank you for listening. God bless you all, and Godspeed on these issues. Thank you. We'll move on to Sheriff Chapman. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, a ranking member, and members of this committee. My name is Mike Chapman. I am the elected sheriff of Loudoun County, and I appreciate the opportunity to appear before this committee today on behalf of the National Sheriff's Association. As you address border security, national security, and the effectiveness of law enforcement. Loudoun County sits about 30 miles southwest of Washington, D.C., and is a home to about 450,000 residents. While not a border county, we face many of the same challenges resulting from a porous border when it comes to illegal immigration, criminal activity, and the movement of illegal drugs. I am in my 46th year of law enforcement, having served seven in local law enforcement 23 as a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration and four domestic assignments to include McAllen, Texas, and in three foreign assignments. I'm a four-time elected sheriff of Loudoun County, having served over 12 years. I serve as a chairman for Homeland Security for the National Sheriff's Association and on the NSA Board of Directors. I previously participated in numerous White House meetings on immigration reform, opioid and MS-13 roundtables, and other congressional hearings and discussions. Today, I would like to highlight two critical issues that are impacting law enforcement nationwide. These are, number one, the proliferation of fentanyl, which is killing more and more Americans and is responsible for a dramatic rise in juvenile overdoses. And two, the influx of illegal immigrants and its impact on criminal activity. In 2021, our nation experienced about 106,000 reported deaths from overdoses and poisonings. Last year, more than 112,000 people died from overdoses, with over 70% of them dying due to fentanyl, more people than would fill a professional football stadium. At Lowndes County, we average about 150 overdoses per year and about 24 deaths. 
Unfortunately, we have seen a significant increase in juvenile drug use and drug overdoses. Last fall, we had 11 reported overdoses within a six-week period among students who attend one high school. Almost all were fentanyl, four occurred on school campus, and most required life-saving administration of Narcan, Naloxone, and or CPR. That was more than half of all the juvenile overdoses for the year at just one of our 19 high schools. These overdoses made national news because I let the public know, much to the chagrin of our school administrators. Having served as a DEA agent in Miami during the mid and late 1980s, I thought I had seen the worst of the drug problem. I was wrong. So what is causing this drug crisis? First and foremost, wide open borders. A few years ago, my agency worked with the DEA on an operation entitled Operation Angels Envy. Kilogram amounts originating from the Sinaloa cartel crossed the California-Mexican border and traversed the U.S. to the Washington, D.C. area. These drugs included enough fentanyl to kill every man, woman, and child in Loudoun County two times over. This demonstrates why every state is now a border state. This gets me to my second point, illegal immigration. The poorest border, lax enforcement policies, the refusal to return illegal migrants to their countries, the discouragement by this administration for local authorities to turn over uh, illegal migrants to ICE, and its overall lack of support to the law, law enforcement in general has been a catalyst for increasing violent crime nationwide. A recent, a recent nationwide online survey entitled TIP, which stands for the Techno, uh, Technometrica Institute of Policy Politics, found that 72% of Americans perceive the southern border as a national security threat, with the same percentage wanting strong enforcement of existing laws. To quote Cochise County Sheriff Mark Daniels, President Biden refuses to acknowledge and exercise his full authority to secure our borders. The study follows a letter to Speaker Johnson from National Sheriff's Association President Greg Champagne last November addressing, at that time, the over 7.5 million illegal immigrants crossing our border to include the capture of 2,000 Chinese aliens. He noted eight steps the U.S. could immediately take to put the brakes on this problem to include, among others, building the remainder of the wall, immediately expelling anyone entering our country illegally, and ending the authority to issue parole. Unfortunately, unfortunately, law enforcement agencies nationwide are suffering from the cascading criminal social impacts of this administration's policies, now coupled with an increase of threat of terrorism. In an April 8th press release by the American Sheriff's Alliance noted that over 700 known or suspected terrorists were apprehended last year at the southern and northern borders. This is a crisis and we need your help. We need a Congress and administration that will help provide better physical barriers, technology, collaborative intelligence, and human resources. But this isn't simply about funding. We need an administration that supports the dangerous work of our profession and encourages the enforcement of existing laws, one that will allow Customs and Border Patrol, uh, Border Protection, ICE, and others to do their job. We need an administration that backs all law enforcement. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here, and of course, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beer. Chairman Grothman, Ranking Member Garcia, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. For nearly half a century, the Cato Institute has produced original research showing that a freer, more orderly, and more lawful immigration system makes the United States a wealthier, freer, and safer country. As America's founders recognized free societies direct people, whatever their background, ancestry, or birthplace, toward activities that benefit mankind. Economist Julian Simon called people the ultimate resource because it is only our creativity and work that transforms natural resources into human resources. Never has immigration been more important to this process than today, when we have nine million open jobs and our labor force would be falling without immigrants. Economically productive people make goods and services that improve the lives of Americans in countless ways. They also make for safer communities. 
Increased economic activity, such as starting businesses and filling housing vacancies, are proven ways to reduce crime. Immigrants reversed the decay in our cities, contributing to massive drops in crime in the 1990s and 2000s. Today, immigrants pay $250 billion in taxes to state and lo local governments, 50% more than they get in benefits, increasing the resources for law enforcement. Many immigrants become law enforcement officers themselves, and many more cooperate with law enforcement to stop and solve crimes. Like everyone else, Immigrants want safe neighborhoods. In the last decade, police agencies have requested legal status for nearly half a million immigrants who are aiding their investigations. Immigrants also directly lower the crime rate by committing fewer serious crimes per capita. Immigrants, according to the U.S. Census Bureau data, are 68% less likely to have committed a crime that has put them in prison. So indiscriminate mass deportation, further cutting off legal immigration, would undermine public safety. Indiscriminate enforcement also has an opportunity cost. Every dollar spent going after immigrant families and workers is a dollar lost to catching people who have victimized people in the United States. When the prior administration decided to mass prosecute immigrant parents with children, U.S. attorneys complained that they were failing to prosecute sex offenders because traumatizing the immigrant kids was too important. Here's another example. In 2020, the prior administration eliminated asylum and began expelling all border crossers to Mexico under Title 42. Did this policy improve security at the border? Not at all. Criminal crossings spiked to record highs by December 2020, and evasions of Border Patrol grew at an unprecedented pace, eliminating people's opportunity to turn themselves in to Border Patrol to request asylum added to the flows of people trying to evade Border Patrol, making it easier for serious threats to evade detection. With very little help from Congress, this administration is trying to improve the situation. It ended Title 42, and evasions have since declined by 70%, according to the Border Patrol chief. It has opened a few legal pathways for entry, which, although limited, have reduced illegal crossings by hundreds of thousands. Policy should focus on making immigration legal and orderly. Instead, Congress's caps on legal immigration block 97% of the applicants for legal permanent residence this year. It's time for a new approach. Make legal immigration possible again. Let me end here. When someone harms another person, justice demands they pay for it. In America, we say, if you do the crime, you do the time. We don't say, if you do the crime, lock up their family, their friends, their co-workers, their co-ethnics. America stands for individual rights and individual responsibility, not collective punishment. So yes, let's talk about how to better go after the bad apples. But the rest of the roughly 50 million immigrants in the United States are here to work with us and for us peacefully. Let them do so legally. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, with unanimous consent, I'd like to ask that William Timmons from South Carolina be waived on the subcommittee for the purpose of asking questions. Without objection, so... Begin my questioning. First of all, I want to ask uh, Mr. or Sheriff Wayburn to follow up on a couple things you said. Just to clarify, you said that the number of people in prison in Venezuela has dropped 25% over the last couple of years? That's the intel that we get up from both uh, the DOJ and from uh, uh, our border partners. You quoted somebody as saying fentanyl, is they were okay as long as fentanyl was killing Americans. Who did you quote again on that? That was a cartel member that we had in custody that we were soliciting information from. Okay, thank you. Now we head from, uh, by the way, I have been at the border and I talked to the Border Patrol and they tell me, quote, Mexico is not setting their best. I mean, I don't think the Border Patrol is... That's, that's their fact. That's what they tell me. So, okay, now, Mr. Cuccinelli, the administration made changes in policy regarding the enforcement of our country's immigration laws. 
and they, these changes shield illegal aliens with criminal histories from removal. I want to discuss Secretary of America's 2021 guidelines for the enforcement of civil immigration law in the 2022 Doyle Memorandum. Did the, uh, Mr. Cuccinelli, did the Biden administration actually make it more difficult for immigration officers to remove criminal illegal aliens? Absolutely and intentionally, and the way to think of those early memos, like the first one there early in 2021, is that they were attempting to tie their own shoelaces together. They literally took steps at ICE and CBP to make it harder for them to achieve their mission structurally. In fact, the Doyle Memorandum says the existence of criminal history alone, regardless of severity, will not necessarily indicate that a non-citizen presently poses a current public safety threat pursuant to the Secretary's priorities. Mr. Cuccinelli, under the standard, an illegal alien, under that standard, an illegal alien convicted of the most heinous crimes, such as rape or murder, could avoid becoming an enforcement priority, correct? Absolutely, that was the point. Is a criminal alien more or less likely to be removed under the Biden administration as compared to the previous administration? Far less likely, and many of them don't even get to ICE because of the catch and release swamping of CBP. Okay. In recent months, we've seen Americans killed, sexually assaulted, and burglarized by illegal immigrants. The illegal aliens who committed these crimes should not have been in the country in the first place, correct? That's absolutely correct. Is it fair to say these crimes should never have happened? Should never have happened. Now, uh, your testimony says the Texas Department of Public and Safety data for the propos for the your testimony cites Texas Department of Safety, Public Safety data for the proposition that illegal aliens commit violent crimes at a higher rate than the average person. Do you note that the data on crime rates, do you note that the data on crime rates is very limited? So I do know that it's very limited. I want to clarify my comments were on the raw numbers, not the rate of crimes committed. Um, I do not believe the rate of crimes is relevant when you've got 6,500 rapes and almost 1,000 homicides, um, I don't think the, the rate of crime matters to the victims of those crimes. Were gangs like MS-13 a problem in Virginia uh, during your tenure as Attorney General? MS-13 was the single most severe violent crime problem in Virginia during my time as AG and before and after. Um, uh, Sheriff Chapman could speak to the present day more acutely than I could, but there was no question that in the last 20 years it is the illegal immigrant-based gangs, which do not cover all of Virginia. The Richmond and Norfolk corridor is still what I would call traditional gangs are predominant there, um, but they are not as violent as the illegal immigrant-based gangs. Okay. Uh, are foreign gangs active in the interior of the U.S., of, active in the interior of the U.S. a violent crime threat? Absolutely, they're one of the worst violent crime threats. And some of the most vicious behavior, some of it is quite extreme. Okay, is it hard to get data on whether or not, uh, data on the total number of crimes committed by illegal immigrants? It's very difficult to get that. It is very difficult. I mean, you, Texas, we're talking about Texas data because they're the only state that has even attempted to track that data for a long period of time. That's also why I noted the Bureau of Justice Statistics analysis of how underreported even those types of crimes are in the first place to say nothing of the challenge of determining if someone's actually here illegally. Okay. Uh, my uh, ranking member here has told us that people crossing the southern border are committing crimes at a, um, a less rate than the native-born population. Do you care to, expand, uh, care to respond to that? So, first of all, in the... In the I'm using round numbers here, but over 10 million people have crossed the border under President Biden. Over 2 million of them, we have no information about their gotaways. Um, and, um, and presumably, there was a reason that they weren't running to Border Patrol. They were running from Border Patrol. So when you hear uh, comments about evasions of Border Patrol being down, uh, that's not necessarily a, a good sign. Uh, if they have a reason to run to Border Patrol because they're going to be caught and released without question, as you noted, regardless of the severity of any criminal record that's uncovered, then then you're going to see more evasions. We have over 2 million of those folks. It's impossible to determine the rate of crime among a group of people we can't even identify. Okay, so really, it would be impossible to get that. It is. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I'll find to Mr. Gar Thank you. Oh, um, before I can, I've only been in Congress for a year. I served as mayor for eight years before that. That is just not the way that you actually take data on crime. So I think we also need to be real realistic and honest about the way crime is measured in the United States. It's measured when a crime is committed, you, that's when you take the data. So this idea of folks running away or not being captured or we're not capturing this crime or that crime is just factually incorrect. I also just want to know that prior to my service as mayor, I was an educator for 10 years in the classroom at the college level, and we use data to make decisions. This idea that we're not going to use data to actually make decisions, I think, is um, is interesting, and, and I certainly don't agree with it. I want to ask some questions about data and about facts, not about what we think is happening or may not be happening. Mr. Beer, good to see you again. I want to put this poster up. I think it's it's important. Uh, and before we get to to the border, I just want you to remind us um, who was president in, in 2020 again? Donald Trump. Thank you. Now, is it true that under Donald Trump, murder rates surged by 30 percent according to data collected by police departments across America to the highest rate since the 90s? Yes, absolutely. Surge in the summer of 2020. And this data was collected by our men and women in, in police, like the Long Beach Police Department, which I um, honorably uh, represented and, and, and helped um, support back in, in my community. Now, since 2020, when we know that President Biden was elected, have violent crime rates increased or fallen? They've fallen year after year, yes. In fact, they have fallen dramatically. Is that correct? And, and we just have reporting early this it, fiscal year, or this 24, 2024, that it, they're continuing to fall. So crime is at, a, at, at incredibly high levels when Donald Trump is elected, and now overall violent crime has dramatically decreased now that President Biden is in office. Is that correct? Over the last four years, crime has Thank fallen. you. And that's actually data reported by our cops. So we want to believe our men and women and law enforcement, that's the data that they're providing us. I also want to talk about some, some uh, violent crime trackers that we've discussed. Murder, we know, has plummeted in the U.S. since 2023, one of the fastest rates of decline we've ever actually had. Now, Mr. Beer, there are 45 million immigrants in this country. Now, why do you think Donald Trump is pushing this migrant crime narrative, which we know is not true? Well, it's because he wants to push policies that ban immigrants. We saw what he did when he was in office. He didn't reduce illegal immigration. He banned legal immigration to the United States. Now, is it fair to say that Trump's rhetoric accusing people, by the way, like me and my family, of poisoning the blood of this country or claiming that we're fueling an invasion actually fuels a potential for violence? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the number of uh, criminals who have uh, uh, engaged in mass shootings. I mean, you're looking at the Pittsburgh shooter, you're like El Paso, Buffalo, uh, Charlottesville. Um, you go down the list, and there are so many times where you hear this great replacement rhetoric being used to justify. Of course, there's crazy people on all sides of every debate, but we shouldn't be fueling it with irresponsible and inaccurate rhetoric. And we've already said and noted that the data provided to us by the men and women of our police departments across the country is also clear that non-citizens, undocumented migrants, actually commit less crimes, actually a lot less crimes than naturalized citizens. Is that correct? That's right. 75% less for legal immigrants, 50% less for illegal immigrants. So a very significant difference. And it's also true that if you look at most of our major American cities, where you, and when you actually look at the undocumented population versus citizens, that those cities, that again, crime is being committed at a much higher rate by citizens than non-citizens. Is that correct? That's right. We've looked at the border sector in uh, cities in particular with a, a great deal of focus on them because they have so, so much cross-border traffic. They're among the safest in the United States, and they saw some of the fastest declines in crime in the 1990s and 2000s when their immigrant populations exploded. And so I think it's really important to paint a real picture of immigration, of migrants, of immigrants that are coming to this country to search for a better life, and move away from the xenophobic rhetoric that, it, that tears down migrants, that tries to somehow paint them as murderers and rapists when the data does not actually support those arguments. And so this idea that we're not going to look at data I think is just, um, uh, it's, it's not, it, it, it's a joke, it's, un, it's unfair, and it's certainly causing more damage across the country than anything positive. I want to just return to, to some of our, our policies as well. Now, Mr. Mr. Beer, one of the majority's witnesses today was, we know, one of the architects of Trump's immigration agenda, which included unprecedented restrictions on legal immigration. To, to close from my questioning, um, how did that actually impact the actual border, those Trump policies? 
oh, when we restrict legal immigration and asylum, we incentivize people to cross the border illegally. If we tell them there's no opportunity to come to this country legally, then of course you're going to see people, more people go to the border and try to seek safety and opportunity that way. It's counterproductive. It's a failed policy. It resulted in more evasions like I talked about. That's a problem for security. We want Border Patrol to focus on serious threats, not people coming for safety and opportunity in this country. Thank you, sir. And I yield back. Okay, uh, Mr. Gosar. Thank you. Mr. Bureau, just to let you take back to the Cato Institute. Thank you very much for the uh, National Emergencies Pamphlet. Really hit the, hit the nail on the head. Now, now to back to immigration. Mr. Beer, what percentage of illegal aliens, aliens are de detained? What percentage are detained? In the entire country? Yep. Well, there's over 12 million illegal immigrants in the United States, so, and there are about 34,000 detention beds funded by Congress, so it's a very small percentage, obviously. Mr. Cuccinelli, how, how would you think about that? Well, even when there were double that number of beds, uh, uh, we were overwhelmed with the demand in terms of, for, for example, there are over a million, last time I looked, over one million final orders of removal in this country. Final orders of removal. They've been all the way through a, 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 a due process pipeline that is more extensive than American criminals get in the criminal justice system and they've been found appropriate to deport. And those beds are intended to be used to detain for while deporting and to hold dangerous uh, individuals while working to deport them. And uh, the fact that we uh, are, have a fraction of the beds that relative to the population that is by law supposed to be in process of being deported right now um, speaks to the priorities of the administration and, frankly, of this Congress. So let me ask you a question. Is the federal current federal law to, for the detention of illegal aliens in this country or found to be in this country? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Yes. Does federal law require the detention of illegal aliens? Yes, it does. Okay, so it should be 100%. So let's go back, let's go back to this number again. So 6.2 million illegal aliens were arrested since President Biden took office until the end of FY 2023. In FY 2021, there were 660,000 illegal aliens known as gotaways, or illegal aliens who avoided capture by Customs and Border Patrol. If one were to extrapolate those numbers for Biden's tenure, what would make, that would make about 2 million individuals as gotaways. So without, all that means is that three out of every five illegal aliens were detained in some fashion or other. Briefly. Briefly, yes. exactly. Mr. Beer, that would make an illegal alien incarceration rate of 60%, would it not? I don't follow the math. No, it would not. Well, there we, are 12 million illegal immigrants in the United States, at least. No, I'm glad you said that, because are you familiar with the Yale and MIT study? Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, if it's that high, then they have a really, really, really low incarceration rate. If it's 25 million, then that no. means you divide all of the, the numerator by, uh, by half. Well, according to your testimony, the incarceration rate of American citizens is about 1.2%, correct? Of American citizens? Yeah. 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 So would you agree that 60% is higher than 1.2%? Yes, but you're making this up. There's I'm not no making it 60, up. There's no 60% of uh, illegal numbers, immigrants who are, who are, are incarcerated. So, Mr. Cuccinelli, would you agree? Oh, with that, yes. I mean, it's How about numbers. you, uh, Sheriff Wayborn? Yes, sir. How about you, Sheriff Chapman? Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Beer, would you agree that with under current law that the incarceration rate, incarceration rate of illegal aliens should be 100% safe for the fact that the brave men and women of the Customs Services and Border Protection are unable to catch all the gotaways? What's it? Should be 100%. It, it's, it's impossible to have 100%. That would be 12 saying, million detention current, beds. Current, that would law, be, current law states 100%. Yes, is, yeah. you pass a law that makes no sense. It is impossible to have 12 million detention beds in the United States. That's multiples of our entire prison population. Mr. Cuccinelli, Sheriff Weber, and Sheriff Chapman, estimates of sexual assault of illegal alien women traveling to the United States range from 31 to as high as 80%. There are media reports of rape trees. Multiple ranchers have personally shown me and met with me and shown the dead bodies of the illegal aliens on their property. 
Do you think the Biden's executive actions facilitating illegal immigration lead to the compassionate outcomes for these illegal alien women, starting with you, Mr. Cuccinelli? No, I mean, those percentages are hard to nail down, uh, but they are significant, they're high, and when you make the pool of victims higher, you end up with more sexual assault. I mean, it's that simple. How about you, Mr. Wayburn? I concur with what he said. How about you, Mr. Chapman? I would agree. I think uh, specifically getting to the number is a little difficult, but uh, definitely a problem. Mr. Chairman, I yield, but I'd like to get to this in the records by you unanimous consent. Okay, so our. Okay, Mr. Lynch. There he is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one thing that we should be able to agree upon is that the situation on our southern border is unacceptable. Just, just from a, just from a starting point. Now, in February, after months of negotiations, a bipartisan coalition in the U.S. Senate unveiled a national security supplemental that included a bipartisan border agreement proposing the most significant border security forms in nearly 30 years. And at President Biden's request, the agreement included over $20 billion for border policy changes, including adding more than 1,500 new Customs and Border Protection personnel. It added uh, a ton of funding for anti-fentanyl and anti-human trafficking uh, provisions. And the, the bipartisan agreement also included $1.4 billion for cities and states that are now currently forced uh, to provide services to uh, migrants. And I know that for my district, which includes uh, the city of Boston uh, and the state of Massachusetts in general, that funding is critical. Massachusetts is currently spending about $75 million a month. So we're up over a billion dollars in the past year uh, to shelter over 7,500 families. Meanwhile, in my own district, uh, in the city of Boston, I have 42,000 U.S. citizen families waiting for public, on, on the waiting list for public housing. 42,000 just, just in the city. I have 180,000 American families, citizens, who are on the list, so they're, they're basically housing insecure, as they say now, right on the edge of homelessness. So there's about 180,000. So the migrant problem is just on top of that, right, uh, with resources and also be because of the emergency nature of, of the situation. And, and I, wa I want to say, in fairness to the governor of Massachusetts and my colleagues in the legislature, I used to serve in the legislature, this is not on them. This is not on them. They, this problem starts at the border. We own this. We in Congress. We own this problem. And uh, <clears throat> I know that some of my state colleagues are getting a lot of heat on this, but they don't have any control over the solution. Um, personally, I would welcome, I would welcome the opportunity to debate and amend and vote on a, a border security bill. And I, I know, look, I know the, the, the agreement in the Senate is far from perfect, but that's what legislation, legislating is about. Uh, I would just ask them to send the bill to the House. We will take it up. We will have to tweak it. That happens with every single bill that, that comes before the legislature here. We'll, we'll have to figure it out. There will be some things I don't like, and there'll be some things that I think we desperately need that will be included. But this is our job. This is our responsibility. People are afraid. People are afraid. So some of that fear is driven by, by inflammatory rhetoric. But some of it is real. Some of it is the data that we've heard here this morning. But we have a responsibility to the people that we represent to take up a bill to figure this out to move away from the model that we have right now. I've been, I've been down to the southern border multiple times with Republicans and Democrats on this committee. I've gone to El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras to try to figure out the, the push factors that, that are driving. Look, I remember we had shooting wars in Honduras and, and Nicaragua and El Salvador. We did not see the levels of immigration during those shooting wars that we now see at the border. So there's something else going on there. There's an industry behind this that is actually recruiting. First of all, they're pushing a narrative. If you get into the United States, you can stay, which is false. 
but they're pushing that narrative and they're, they're moving people to the border. And, and the president should have the ability, authorized by Congress, if we see 30,000 people coming to this border, to our border, and we know it will overwhelm the system that we have at the border to regulate the flow of people into this country and to figure out who they are, why they're coming, we should have the ability, the president should have the ability to declare an emergency and close that border until we regulate the flow to something that the current judicial system, the asylum system, can, can actually assimilate and, and to judge those people based on who they are and why they are attempting to come into our country. But that's not happening right now. That's not happening right now. So I'm just urging my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, bring a bill to the floor. Let's let regular order try to figure this out. You won't get everything you want, but neither will we on, on this side of the aisle. But we will make it a better situation for everyone involved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, to the sheriffs that are here, Loudoun County and the uh, distinguished gentleman from Tarrant County. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Wayborn is a good friend of mine, and I applaud him. Mr. Cuccinelli, good to see you again. Thank you for your service to this country. I think it's interesting that we hear up here about the problem or problems and whose job it is, whether it be the Congress or whether it be something else. But let's just pin the tail on the donkey. It is the administration that is sending the welcome sign and making sure that people up and down, not just south of here, but all over the world, the word, word is out. I think the things that uh, Stephen spoke about is exactly correct. The people who are losing are the American people, poor Americans, Americans who grew up here. Uh, this administration took some $370 million that was des designed and earmarked uh, or at least allocated uh, in appropriations for d veterans who've been disabled. They took that money from disabled veterans. What we're looking at is a political circumstance, and yet we forget that for four years the Democrats had control of this uh, body also. It is a tough issue. Two weeks ago or three, I was the speaker at an immigration ceremony where there were about 50 people in McLennan County, Texas, who came, and I spoke to them, and I told them, welcome to the United States, and I talked to them, and I told them this is their country now, but I told them, leave your customs behind because you're now an American. Leave the laws there behind. And they openly told me, yes, we went through extensive study. We believe that what we have learned in this process of legal immigration has helped us to be better citizens. While we sought the advantages that have been talked about in this subcommittee hearing of money, we really viewed it as, as I told them, you have a right and a responsibility. I will say to each and every one of you, I sit on the side where I believe that we should require everybody to go through that process. Legal immigration that we're confusing with someone in the attack against a Donald Trump. The bottom line is the law should be the law. They fail to say they blame it all on South America. It's 97 other countries also that people come from illegally. And they bring their customs with them and they prey on those individual markets. They will go where people who are from their country are all across this country. And of course, you and I both know that sanctuary cities allow that. And I have dealt with, and I don't want to do it today, but I've dealt with how police officers, not sheriffs, police officers deal with illegals in sanctuary cities and literally do no record keeping because they know they're not looking at someone who is the real person. And they dismiss them because they don't want to house them. They do not hold them accountable for the same law that they'll hold Americans accountable for. They take billions of dollars 
not just schools, not just health care, and move it to them. And then we've got people that come up here and say, we've just got to handle this bill because Uncle Sam will pay all this money. Well, I know what the money's for. The money's to take in an extra million people illegally because it is embarrassing how they've jammed into cages. And when President Trump was in office and this surge did happen, they called him uh, names because they were in cages. So what does the Biden administration do? They waive all the laws. They don't even take people, children, as they come across and follow them where they're going because there's so many. They're flooding our cities. They're fr flooding this country. And then we turn around and argue about levels of, of people who are committing crimes. It's a crazy thing. But the way you fix this is by having the authority and the responsibility to stop this, to control it, to give our men and women of law enforcement the opportunity to protect themselves and protect this country and then go into a process that might be not only fair, but look right also. I've been to the border many times. It doesn't look right. You see all sorts of people coming across in their casual attire because they simply showed up and knew they'd get in. They take an Uber from San Diego, uh, from uh, Tijuana, to come across. It is true. I've seen it. So, so for those of you who don't think it's true, you ought to go back because you can see it anytime you want. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. You didn't just place something right in front of us and expect us to do the heavy lift. We know it deals with a president, the administration, who has to be honest about what they're doing also. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the people who are here, all four of them, and I want to thank you for having us here, and I yield back my time. Uh, Mr. Frost. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Since the beginning of his campaign for president, Donald Trump in 2015 has been consistently propagating hateful extremist rhetoric about immigrants, including falsehoods depicting all Mexican immigrants as criminals, as drug dealers, and as rapists. At a campaign event just last month, Trump, Trump claimed that immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country. The Republican witnesses here today are the latest in a line of people spreading racist, far-right fiction in an attempt to dehumanize immigrants. Mr. Beer, I want to get back to some truth in this conversation. Is someone more likely to commit a crime if they are born in the United States or if they are foreign-born? If they are born in the United States. And you wrote in a Time article that I have right here, quote, no matter how researchers slice the data, through the numbers show that immigrants commit fewer crimes than native-born Americans, but that's not good enough for Trump followers. They firmly believe that immigrants make America less safe. What the anti-immigration crowd needs to understand is that not only are immigrants less likely to commit crimes than native-born Americans, but, they're also, uh, but they also protect us from crime in several ways, end quote. And you're 100% right in that. Several studies show that immigrants are 46% less likely to commit a crime and that in communities that have had an influx of undocumented immigrants, crime actually goes down. Collectively, American undocumented immigrants pay an estimated $11.64 billion, billion dollars in state and local taxes every single year. And the average undocumented immigrant has been living and contributing to the economic success of our country for between 10 and 14 years. These are folks who are literally putting more into our system than they're taking out because they're undocumented. These are our friends, our family, um, teachers, substitute teachers, people who work in the medical field, people who work in hospitality, our neighbors, my family. Mr. Beer, how might white supremacist falsehoods about an invasion put immigrant communities in danger? Look, we've we talked about this before. Uh, we've, we've seen the El Paso shooter manifesto, uh, the Buffalo shooter, uh, you go to Charlottesville, you saw what happened there. Um, the Pittsburgh uh, synagogue shooter. I mean, the, the number of crimes where now dozens of people have been murdered, it's astounding. It's, 
it's they are saying what's motivating them. It's it's this idea that there these people are invaders and therefore they can be responded to with uh, military style force. Yeah, and it just makes me wonder because we keep hearing from colleagues on the other side, some of these witnesses, that I guess the rate doesn't matter or the data doesn't matter, and what really matters are the 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 families and the victims, which I hundred percent agree with. But then they completely disregard the families and victims of immigrant communities because of the hateful rhetoric that they are pushing. What about the friends and families of victims who have been murdered in schools across this country because my colleagues refuse to do anything to end gun violence? Does that matter? I guess not. We've already seen how this hateful anti-immigrant rhetoric has been taken up by bad actors to justify horrific violence that against everyday Americans. And for example, when a gunman walked into a Walmart store, killing 23 people and injuring another 22. Almost exactly a year ago, Oversight Committee Democrats called on Chairman Comer and every Oversight Republican to condemn this rhetoric. Um, Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter dated March 6, 2023 from Ranking Member Raskin to Chairman Comer, yet again inviting you to condemn white nationalism and white supremacy in all forms, including the Great Replacement Theory. Without objection. Not only have my Republican colleagues refused to condemn this extreme rhetoric, but they've also invited witness here, witnesses here who keep pushing it. I mean, we have Mr. Chapman, a sheriff, um, who should really be focused on the real causes of crime and violence. Under his watch, gun-related inju injuries surged by 57% in 2021. Mr. Chapman, I have one simple question for you. Do you know who the, your county sheriff's office pays to do the firearm disposal and how much you pay them for your firearms disposal? Uh, I would argue the statistics that you just mentioned about our... That's not the question I asked, Sheriff. Um, I just want to know... Well, I think it's important you know. to correct the record. I, I'd like to know who your office pays for firearm disposal and how much you pay them. Our firearms are handled by our firearms unit, and any disposal will come under them. Okay, gotcha. Most and, or many um, law enforcement agencies... Um, contract with disposal companies. And something that is of grave concern to me is that a lot of these companies are not doing what they've promised and they're not destroying firearms. And we're seeing these firearms being put back on the streets, which is why I introduced my bill, Destroy Zombie Guns Act, which makes serious reforms to help keep all Americans safer. Um, I implore my colleagues on this committee to co-sponsor the bill and to join me in fighting for real positive change for public safety for all people. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'll just wait. We're going to suspend for one minute because I have somebody supposedly walking in the halls who's almost here.
Okay. Um, okay, well, we'll begin closing statements. I guess there's some people who may or may not make it. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony. Uh, well, what, should I yield to uh, the ranking member first? Yeah, well, would you? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. No, I, I just want to add, I want to thank our witnesses again. I just want to reiterate what I said earlier, that I think um, when we have these hearings, it's really important that we focus on, cr on, on the crime data and the data that is provided to us by our law enforcement agencies. I want to reiterate what I said before, that non-citizens, undocumented uh, immigrants consistently, and not just by, uh, by a little, by significantly commit less crime than citizens do. And I just repeat that just because I think the demonization of migrants and immigrants is wrong. All, we can all agree that all crime, we, we, we're concerned about all crime committed by anyone. We should focus on reducing that, but we should not be demonizing um, non-citizens as somehow um, rapists or murderers or worse than um, because they actually do commit less crime. And with that, I will, I will um, yield back. Okay. Okay, I guess I'll wait for a minute. Mr. Timmons is going to ask some questions. We'll suspend for one minute. Oh, we got two, two people here. Should we take her first? Okay, Ms. Mace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good morning, everyone. One crime by one illegal alien is one too many. Last year, an illegal alien who was deported in 2021 after being convicted in Charleston County, South Carolina, of sexually abusing a nine-year-old was convicted for illegally returning after it was discovered he used our wide open border to enter, re-enter our country and return to Charleston, South Carolina. Last fall in October, a young three-year-old girl named Maddie Hines in South Carolina was tragically killed by an illegal alien in a car crash. The individual who committed the crime was deported under President Trump and his administration. The illegal was able to re-enter re into the United States under Joe Biden um, because of his wide open and dangerous border policies that put American lives at risk. Several weeks ago, the Low Country was put on high alert as an illegal alien wanted by law enforcement in Dorchester County for two counts of unlawful possession of a firearm was on the run. Uh, with this firearm, with this uh, illegally possessed gun. In January, an illegal alien from Honduras murdered an American citizen in Columbia, South Carolina, our state's capital, after crossing the border illegally last year. Um, fentanyl trafficked across our southern border by criminal cartels has killed 1,660 South Carolinians um, alone. It's clear that the Biden administration's policies have turned every state in this nation into a border state, every town into a border town. We have had members of MS-13 gang arrested in Beaufort, South Carolina. We've had human trafficking busts. In fact, three years ago in my hometown, you've never heard of it, it's called Goose Creek, South Carolina, there was a human trafficking bust with 28 people arrested. Two years ago in Somerville, South Carolina, there was a sex trafficking bust with over 20 people arrested. Joe Biden's open border policies have enabled an illegal alien crime wave to sweep across South Carolina and the nation. So I have a few questions for our witnesses today, and I want to thank you for being here. My first question will go to you, Mr. Cuccinelli. I found it staggering that in 2021, uh, in a memo in 2021, Secretary Mayorkas wrote, the fact that an individual is a removable non-citizen will not alone be the basis of an enforcement action against them. Why is Joe Biden and his administration waiting until these illegals commit serious crimes before deporting them, if they deport them at all? I was going to say, in fact, they're not deporting them even when they do commit serious mm -hmm. crimes. And I can only conclude that they want the border invasion that they have opened the borders for, for their own reasons. Right. I, I've actually talked to different police uh, and law enforcement agents across the country, most recently the NYPD and in New York, for example. They're letting illegals 
just completely walk out of there when they're committing heinous crimes. Um, can you speak to the policies put in place by Joe, De Joe Biden's Department of Homeland Security uh, that have disempowered ICE, allowing criminal aliens to roam free, victimizing American citizens? Yeah, so early in the Biden tenure, in the early 2021, in both ICE and CBP, um, memo, you cited one memo, but mm -hmm. there were others, if you'll recall that time period, where the administration, through Secretary Mayorkas, intentionally made it difficult for both CBP and for ICE to accomplish their missions. It's part of, by the way, why the morale in those two organizations is as low as it has ever been, because you sign up to do a job and then you are actually impaired by your leadership from doing that job. And that's reflected in the number of criminals uh, that are even coming into their uh, custody to ICE. When CBP is catching and releasing 85% of their apprehensions, ICE doesn't even see most of these folks and doesn't get a chance to thoroughly vet them. CBP's vetting is not as thorough. They're not in detention. They're, process they're basically turned into a human processor right now under the Biden administration. Thank you. And my next question is for Sheriff Chapman. In your testimony, you mentioned you were experiencing, quote, discouragement by this administration for local authorities to turn over illegal migrants to ICE. Can you clarify uh, further what uh, Mr. Cuccinelli's comments are, what the administration is doing to discourage you from turning over illegal aliens to ICE? Uh, well, I can certainly uh, speak to that with regards to the police departments that's around the Washington, D.C. area, uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, Fairfax and, and some of the mm -hmm. other departments around where they're, they're not even allowed to notify ICE about, uh, about people that are incarcerated. Uh, for us, we do. Uh, we take that, uh, we go that extra mile. We make sure that we notify ICE in Loudoun County. That it largely has to do with the fact that I'm an elected official and not answering to, to boards that have their own political agendas in place. So we, we do make every effort to contact ICE, and we have a very good success rate. The majority of people that ICE want turned over to them, we do in timely manner, and that way they can pursue whatever other charges they want to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Okay, oh, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you letting me wave on to this uh, subcommittee. I've been in Congress five and a half years, and never once has an issue polled as high as concerns with the southern border. We're talking 40 plus percent. It is the number one issue of my constituents. And it's the number one issue for my constituents because eight and a half million people cross the southern border illegally. It's the number one issue because hundreds of thousands of American citizens have died from fentanyl overdoses, the vast majority of which is coming across the southern border. It's the number one issue for my constituents because all of the social safety net programs that American citizens rely on are being overly burdened by the eight and a half million that have come in the last three and a half years or the 10 plus million that have been here for much longer. So these are the biggest challenges that uh, our country is facing right now. And it really is frustrating because originally the administration said the border's secure, the border's secure. For the first three years, they said the border was, was secure. And then the last six months, after the House Republicans have repeatedly said the border's not secure, we must do something, they finally changed their tune. And they changed their tune because the Democrat mayors in uh, all these sanctuary cities are going crazy because their social safety nets are broken. They're tens of billions of dollars short. And they're asking for relief. And this president, all he has to do is sign his name, undo the executive orders he did three and a half years ago, and solve this problem. I mean, I guess I just want to ask the, the sheriffs, why do you think this president is doing this? Why do you think this administration is doing this? Uh, Sheriff Wayborn, any thoughts? I'm afraid I don't. Uh, I don't know why, why this is. I know that Speaker Johnson spoke of the other day that, that there's people in Congress that would like to be able to give them the ability to vote. So I would think that maybe it's a political issue such as that. Mr. Chap uh, Sheriff Chapman, thoughts? Uh, I would agree with Sheriff Weber, and I can't specifically say, but it, it appears that, that that's the reason. So uh, the best I can tell is there's two real reasons. Number one is the census. Reapportionment is going to occur in six years. And the, the, the idea is that you bring a couple million, 8, 10, 12 million people into this country, and you lure them with social safety net programs, you lure them with uh, government benefits, and they go to the blue states. They go to the cities that offer wildly disproportionate social benefits 
uh, to their, uh, those in need. Um, and that's what we're seeing in New York. But they're going there. And I guess when the census occurs, it's going to result in um, New York and California and Illinois receiving a disproportionate, uh, a disproportionate percent of their representation because we do not apportion the census based off of citizens. We apportion the census based off of humans. And I mean, I think that's a big problem. And, you know, at the end of the day, the chairman of judiciary last Congress, Chairman Nadler, specifically said that the, the objective was to give these individuals the right to vote. I mean, when the towers fell, 3,000 plus Americans died. We went to war. We spent hundreds of billions of dollars to hold them accountable. Here we are. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have died from fentanyl overdoses. The, the amount of human misery occurring uh, in this country because of the lawlessness at our southern border is just shocking. The cartels terrorize Mexico because they're making tens of billions of dollars off of this administration's border policies. Uh, it, it's just shocking. I mean, the, the president recently said that he was going to um, address this somehow, implying he would maybe sign an executive order and reinstate Remain in Mexico, which would um, substantially address the concerns that we have. But I mean, it's only because there's an election coming and he's so far underwater in his approval ratings. And I mean, it really is a sad day for this country that the President of the United States is, it seems like he's destroying the American dream because the American people are hurting. Inflation is, is killing their dreams of home ownership. Interest rates are through the roof. Um, hundreds of thousands of people are dying from fentanyl. They're not safe. The, the, the defund the police movement has resulted in enormous violence and un, in insecurity in our cities. And I mean, our country's just on the wrong track. And um, we really need to change course. And uh, with that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Crockett. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm going to go straight to Sheriff Wayburn because I don't know if you recognize it, but I actually represent a portion of Tarrant County. So I'm very familiar with some things that are going on there. So I want to talk about some of those things. Before I do that, though, I do want to address the last things that were brought up about the census. And I'm not really sure if my colleague recognizes that Texas actually got two new congressional seats. The state of Texas actually grew a whopping 4 million people. And um, because of those 4 million people that came into Texas, or from wherever they came from, um, we actually got two new congressional seats, which Texas historically has been a red state. And New York actually lost a seat, which historically has been um, a blue state. So I did want to make sure we put some facts on the record. But um, we are talking about immigrants a lot. In fact, there's a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric and blaming of immigrants when certain things happen. And based on things coming out of this committee, we seem to believe that immigrants are the reason why crime is up and why our communities are less safe. So I did my research, and I want to go through some of it with you, specifically about Tarrant County, because I don't want you to have to know statistics about somewhere else. So with that being said, um, Sheriff, do you know if within the last year between 2022 and 2023, if there was an increase or decrease in murder and negligent homicide in Tarrant County? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, uh -huh. it, but it did not increase. Okay. In fact, it went down by almost 17%. So great job. Um, what about manslaughter by negligence, or we call it criminally negligent homicide? I believe it also went down. Yes. In the past, it may be on ticking up at, at the moment on um, intoxicated and homicide may be ticking up at the moment in 24. Okay. Well, we had a 56.52% decrease. How about rape? All those categories we believe went down. Absolutely. And, and I do credit a lot of incredible law enforcement and municipal police chiefs. Awesome. So there actually was a decrease by 3.35% in rape. Robbery went down 4.5% and both aggravated and simple assault went 
collectively down by 3.18%, and theft went down by 3.89%. This is at the same time in which we're talking about the migrant community and stoking these fears that they're bringing all of this trauma and this crime and violence to our communities. But when we look at a Texas community, Tarrant County, actually everything has gone down. And I do want to thank you for your service in that way because it takes a team. It can't just be one thing. It means we've got to have great law enforcement, but we also have to have really good policies. And we honestly need to be honest about the data that we see. So overall, it shows me that sheriff in Tarrant County, um, all crime was down, is what I can tell from the numbers. And do you know if Dallas County, which is next door, if they had an increase or decrease in overall crime? I think all of North Texas, we saw decreases. In, Absolutely. In, in, every, every one. And uh, again, Chief Garcia, Chief Neil Noakes, there's some great police work going on in both of those counties. Absolutely. So I'm going to move on to something else really quickly. One of the things that I want to talk about is um, the border in general and policies. Um, I'm not sure that you're aware, but I'm going to make sure that it's clear that the Senate worked on a bill, much like the Senate has done a lot more work than the House has done this entire session. And the only reason that that bill has not come to the floor to help those that need help as relates to the border crisis is because Donald Trump specifically said that it should not come to the floor. In addition to that, I want to talk specifically about some concerns that I do have in Tarrant County. While I am so thankful that the numbers have gone down, there's been a concern about the fact that there has been a consultant that's had to come in, and this consultant has had to come into Tarrant County, potentially to the tune of approximately $200,000 for an 18-month contract to help the elected sheriff identify solutions for an extensive list of jail deaths, an alarming shortage in detention officer staff, and the necessity for Tarrant County to address its overcrowded jail by entering into a $40 million contract with a privatized jail outfit to house Tarrant County's inmates in Garza County. That is concerning to me. Um, it is concerning because as a former public defender, I actually had clients that died in the jail. And most people don't understand that the main job of a sheriff is usually to make sure that they're taking care of the jail population. And so, Sheriff, I want to make sure that while they've brought you to D.C., that we make sure that we're taking care of Tarrant County, where you and I both are locally elected to serve, because we cannot have a situation in which we have um, violations of people's civil rights potentially due to overcrowding, or we can't have a situation where we're losing lives because we are helping out our friends who are trying to stoke more fears about the migrant community because the one thing that we know from the data is when it comes to migrants in the state of Texas, specifically in Tarrant County, if anything, it looks like the numbers have gone down as far as crime overall instead of going up. And so we know that while it is a team effort, this idea that this president is doing something so nefarious that he is trying to bring people in so that he can get them to vote for him or he can get them to help out a census in a particular state. That's just not what the case is. But I do thank you for your time. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Oh, we got Mr. Turner. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today as we discuss the ongoing border crisis. The invasion at our southern border didn't happen by accident. During the 2020 presidential campaign, then-candidate Joe Biden promised to protect sanctuary cities from federal law enforcement, pledged to halt deportations, and encouraged millions of asylum seekers to surge to the southern border. It didn't take long for the president to make good on his open border promises. In his first 100 days of his administration, President Biden took over 94 executive actions to reverse Trump-era immigration policies and undermine America's border security. The Biden White House ended Remain in Mexico, halted construction of the border wall, and did away with Title 42 expulsions. These disastrous policies have turned every state into a border state. President Biden's sanctuary city policies and catch and release practices complicate the efforts of Border Patrol, ICE, and local law enforcement to keep our streets safe and protect our communities. 
This unprecedented level of illegal immigration is redirecting essential resources away from their critical role in crime prevention, costing taxpayers billions of dollars and leaving our communities more vulnerable. The unchecked flow of illegal immigrants across our southern border not only undermine our law, but also opens the door for bad actors to enter the country undetected. Under President Biden, more than 600,000 illegal immigrants with criminal records or pending criminal charges have been released into the United States. Our communities now face an increased threat from drug smugglers, human traffickers, and violent criminals who exploit our weakened southern border, each crime being entirely preventable. We are now confronting a full-blown public safety crisis, one that stretches far beyond the border states and impacts the entire nation. This administration's actions, or lack thereof, sends a message that our laws can be blatantly ignored and violations will go unpunished. For far too long, Secretary Mayorkas and the entire Biden administration have refused to enforce our nation's immigration laws and turned their backs on the victims of this worsening crisis. It's unacceptable and this committee must hold them accountable. Sheriff Chapman, thank you for being here today. My district is not located on the southern border, yet I still hear from my constituents in Kansas every single day who are impacted by this administration's open border policies. Would you agree that the implications of the border crisis are widespread, affecting not just the border communities, but also towns and cities across the entire nation? Absolutely. And as I said in my opening comments, probably the biggest reflection of that is the overdose deaths that we're seeing throughout the country here over the last several years. Now they've exceeded 100,000 and with the, the vast majority of those being fentanyl. So um, when you're talking about an impact, that definitely is an impact and it's killing so many people throughout our country. As a sheriff of a non-border state, could you discuss the specific challenges that you as chief law enforcement officer remain vigilant to guard against in light of the administration's border policies? Well, fortunately, as an elected official, I, uh, I have the ability, as I mentioned earlier, to contact ICE when we have uh, people that need to go to ICE that are, uh, that are being detained. Uh, but uh, but we, we are concerned about uh, an increase, and in certainly with MS-13 and 18th Street gang members uh, coming in as a result of this, we did have a problem. Uh, several years ago with, uh, with, with gang members. Uh, we are concerned that that's going to um, reignite itself here as this problem continues. I'd like to shift, uh, stick with you, but shift our discussion to the topic of sanctuary jurisdictions, mm -hmm. which limit the ability of ICE to fully enforce immigration laws, as you know well. In your opinion, how do sanctuary jurisdictions affect public safety? Uh, I think uh, sanctuary jurisdictions uh, are extremely uh, detrimental to public safety uh, because it allows allows people that shouldn't be here uh, in locations where they shouldn't be and allows them to basically commit crime. Uh, fortunately, we're not one of those, but, uh, but I do believe uh, some of our uh, surrounding locations are, uh, and I just think it poses a, 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 an enormous danger to the citizens of those areas. Describe how important you think it is for local jurisdictions to work with federal government to enforce U.S. immigration law. Extremely important. Uh, I'm retired from the Drug Enforcement Administration as a special agent. I have very good relationships with all of our federal counterparts here, uh, and I think for the most part, everybody wants to do the right thing. Unfortunately, political um, uh, agendas get in the way of that often, and, uh, and, but as far as we go, it's very important for us to constantly work, notify other people and other uh, agencies of what's going on so that we can address these issues promptly and keep our citizens safe. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Goldman. No, go ahead. Do you want, you want to go? I'd rather wait. I just sat down if that's okay. Chairman, up to you. Mr. Fallon. All right. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Um, I heard some of the questioning earlier in uh, some of our Democratic colleagues were focusing on, are illegal immigrants less likely to, to commit crimes than native-born American citizens? And I think we're asking the wrong question. First of all, uh, in relation to that, we don't know if that's a true statement or not. We don't know if they're less or more likely because the studies that were done were flawed and they cite a Cato study. And yet in the Cato study, they say, and I quote, we can't make a direct apples to apples comparison between Texas and other states. We also don't see studies 
done when we've had this Biden border crisis and this explosion. When you look at the Obama administration, about 1.7 million illegal encounters in the first three years, about the same with Trump, the Trump administration, and then it went up to almost 8 million. We don't know the impact of that yet. So I like to begin, unlike so many people in Congress, I like to begin with doubts and then end in certainties, not the other way around. I don't want to put my thumb on the scale. I want to know the truth, not their truth or our truth. There is no such thing as that. There's such thing as one thing, the truth. So we're asking the wrong question. Should we, we should be asking this question. Are we safer or not with mass unlawful migration? And I think I can answer that definitively. We are less safe when we allow mass unlawful migration. Take case in, port, uh, case in point in Texas, my home state. Between June of 2011 and March of 2024, there were 513,000 crimes committed by criminal aliens, 428,000 criminal aliens just in Texas were arrested that resulted in 187,000 felony convictions. So I think our job here in Congress is to make all American citizens as safe as possible, allowing for mass unlawful migration, sticking your head in the sand and pretending it doesn't exist or it's not harmful is absolutely ludicrous. It doesn't matter if somebody is more or less likely. Clearly, criminal aliens exist, and they've committed mass amount of crimes in Texas. Sheriff uh, Wavering, great to see you again. You're a great American. <laughs> While there are several factors in play, is it possible that the rise in crime recently in Texas has some correlation to the rise in the number of illegal migrants in Texas? I believe you answered your own question a while ago. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can tell that, uh, depending on the documentation. Uh, we've actually, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, have seen a decrease in crime, but we don't know. Uh, that community, a lot of times, simply doesn't report it. And uh, we know that for a fact. Well, yeah, and who are the criminal, uh, Sheriff, who are the, uh, the criminal migrant gangs like MS-13 and others, who are they most likely to prey on demographically? Are they most likely to prey on white Americans, black Americans, or Hispanic Americans? Hispanic Americans. Yeah, they're, they're actually disproportionately more of a threat, people of color in this country, to this criminal element. That's, that's it, and I believe you were part of the legislature in Texas where we changed the law where we can't ask immigration status of a victim to get them to come more out of the shadows to tell us who's, who's, who, who is attacking them. Yeah, it's about protecting innocence and justice. Uh, also, Sheriff, uh, my constituents are telling me repeatedly, expressing concerns about the border and illegal migration. It's the number one thing I hear at town halls. What are you hearing from your, uh, your constituencies in Tarrant County? I think they're very concerned about the open border and have been for the last several years and the plethora of drugs that are coming across it and the impact it is of having it to our communities because it knows no bounds. It's is this just Republican? Uh, no, 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 sir. This is, this is the citizens in general. And is it just a certain demographic? Is it just white Americans or is it all, all shapes, all sizes, Americans. and shades? All Americans. Um, sheriff Chapman, you're sheriff in Virginia. Uh, are the, are, do you feel like border concerns are something that you hear about as well up there? And are you concerned? Well, certainly I'm concerned about uh, what's going on with the border and the impact that it's having the, across the country to include uh, Loudoun County, Virginia. Um, Mr. Beer, uh, yes or no answer. Uh, would you agree it would be potentially dangerous to allow uh, a complete stranger into your home? I wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. Right. I mean, so no, depends I mean, on the circumstances. Fair. I mean, it, it, it's 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 clear that somebody knocks on your door, you know who they are. I don't let them in either. I mean, I don't know. It depends on who they are. Well, you said no. A family with kids. No. Yeah. A complete. Why stranger. shouldn't it be okay. too hasty? Okay. All right. So you would uh, a stranger, family, and kids. How many uh, strangers and kids are in your home right now? None that I know None. of. So you don't invite? Uh, do, you, do you do you house any illegal migrants in your home, or I should just say migrants that have crossed the border in your home? No. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <laughs> Mr. Goldman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Beer, I, I want to go back to a little bit about what my colleague from Texas was talking about in terms of the, the data. Um, obviously, it's self-evident that if there are more people in the country and a particular, a specific percentage of people commit crimes, there's going to be more crime, right? Yes, the That's, absolute number will increase if the total population is larger. Okay. 
But you and, and the Cato Institute have done some work um, on this, and, and what have you, in terms of comparing uh, the data that is available, which is limited, of the number of uh, non-American citizens who commit crime versus those who are citizens of the United States? And, and just to summarize again what you have found. Well, the U.S. Census Bureau data, which goes through 2022, shows that uh, non-Americans or, or immigrants are 68% less likely to have committed a crime that put them in prison at that time. Uh, and if you look at it, break it down by legal status, you can say that 75% less likely for legal immigrants and uh, about 50% less likely for uh, illegal immigrants. And we keep hearing about why this is such a big surprise. It's not a surprise if you look at the demographic characteristics of immigrants. They're more likely to work, more likely to marry, particularly if you look at male immigrants. Men commit the vast majority of crimes in this country. Male immigrants work at a, a rate almost double when you control for education level than uh, similarly educated uh, Americans. Right. And, and there are other studies that, that have been done. The, the Marshall Project in the New York Times found that between 2007 and 2016, there was no link between undocumented immigrants and a rise in violent or property crime in those communities. Sheriff Weyburn was talking about in Dallas, crime is down. Crime in New York City is down also, and we've had a, a significant influx uh, of new, newly arrived migrants. So I, I, yes, of course, there will be more crime as there are more people. But if the argument is that our country is proportionately or disproportionately more dangerous and insecure and unsafe because of the influx of migrants, the statistics just simply don't bear that out. Is that right, Mr. Beer? That's right. No one's saying we should continue illegal immigration. The question is, should we allow people to come legally to this country or not? That's the whole question. It's already illegal to come here illegally. So the question is, should they be allowed to stay, have a path to legal status, have a path to come in legally? And we keep hearing that there's such this big threat. No, if the crime rate goes down, that means your likelihood of being a victim of a crime goes down. And that's a good thing. Well, let's focus on something that um, my Republicans don't like to talk about, which is the impact of guns uh, on the, both the fentanyl trade and the influx of migrants. Uh, am I correct? Uh, Mr. Beer, that the cartels broadly rule the border in terms of the fentanyl trade as well as a lot of the migration? Is that accurate? A absolutely. They charge a fee to cross the border illegally. They control the traffic. They force people to cross where they want them to cross. It's, it yeah. is controlled and by Sheriff Weyburn, do you agree? Absolutely. And Sheriff Weyburn, do you agree that the cartels are able to control the fentanyl trade and the border because they possess weapons, guns, that help give them the, the power and authority? I haven't in inventoried their weapons, of course, but uh, they are a very powerful outlaw uh, organization, and they do have tools. Um, Sheriff Weyburn, would you be surprised to hear that uh, over 500,000 guns are trafficked annually from the United States to Mexico? None of those figures would surprise me. Right. Um, in fact, there's only one gun store in Mexico. It is almost impossible for, to get uh, a gun in Mexico. And so the cartels, who you've acknowledged, Sheriff Wayborn, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure, uh, Mr. Cuccinelli, I think you've acknowledged that to me in the past, uh, the cartels rule with guns, but they rule with American-made guns. And yet, we are doing nothing to try to stop the uh, trade, try to stop, stop the export of American-manufactured guns to the cartels, which give them the power to run the fentanyl trade and to wreak havoc at the border. And that is why I introduced a bill, the Disarming Cartels Act. I urge my Republican colleagues who do not discuss guns once in their seminal border security package to join us in trying to actually solve the problem. And to solve the problem, you need to stop the export of American-made guns to the drug cartels so that that will limit and eliminate their power. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. 
Uh, we already heard the closing statement from the ranking member, so now I'll give you uh, my closing statement. Uh, first of all, to respond to a couple of the comments on the other side, uh, we heard from Matt O'Brien, former head of ICE, uh, either last commi committee or two committees ago, that he felt that people who were here illegally committed crimes with a substantially greater number <coughs> than the native born. As far as the recent drop in the number of uh, murders in this country, I think that was because, or anybody looking at the statistics would know, that there was a spike up uh, at the time George Floyd died, I kind of called the Floyd effect, and for the year thereafter, I guess uh, on a federal level it would be fiscal year uh, 01 to 02, Donald Trump's final year, uh, there was a, a big increase, but that wasn't because of any overall policy, that was because George Floyd uh, died during that time and it kind of resulted in a, uh, a big increase. It is very difficult to get exact statistics, so I can tell you anecdotally, um, law enforcement in my area does not believe that, or is aware of crimes being committed by immigrants. A lot of times they don't even have statistics, though. It surprises me that when I talk to local sheriff's departments or uh, people who run the local corrections and I ask how many people are here illegal, they have no idea. And that's in Wisconsin. I think in other states where you have, where they pride themselves on being sanctuary cities, I'm sure it's much more difficult to get those numbers. Uh, so as a result, they have to rely on both uh, what Mr. O'Brien said and anecdotal evidence that I gather in Wisconsin. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you one more time for being here. We had very interesting uh, testimony today about the difficulty it is in removing people who have even committed crimes in the United States. The Biden administration has specifically made it more difficult to deport a criminal even after they have committed a crime. And uh, we, we heard in the past as well that, um, I believe it was from Mr. O'Reilly, a different witness, that he went back or, I'm sorry, it was one of the uh, immigration judges. He went back and looked to see what happened to people who he ordered deported after they had committed crimes. And under the Biden administration, he found that none of these people were deported, which is an indication that the policy of the Biden administration is we want to get as many new people in here as possible. And even if an immigration judge orders somebody deported, we're not going to kick them out. And that's the attitude that permeates this whole discussion, which is one of the reasons why we have such a massive increase of illegal immigrants in this country, together with the cost of the illegal immigrants and crime committed by those immigrants. So in any event, I'd like to thank the four of you for being here one more time. With that and without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit materials and additional written questions for the witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses. If there's no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>